Hello everybody and welcome to another one of my political ideas videos. In fact, hopefully this will be the last of them uh, because this will mean I've got a full set of all the different aspects for liberalism, socialism, conservatism and nationalism. So we are looking at the final part of the picture and it's probably the most important bit as well, which is our key thinkers. So there are already some um, short 60 second videos on each one of these, but I'm going to go into them in a bit more detail. So the nationalism key thinkers, we've got Rousseau, Herder, Manzini, uh, Morass and Garvey. And we'll look at them and their, their ideas and how they fit with some of the potential arguments or debates that you might be asked to look at in the exam. Right, so the first of our key thinkers is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778. He was a, a Swiss French philosopher who influenced the French Revolution and, and liberalism in general. So he, he could quite easily have ended up in our liberalism key thinkers as well, rather than our, our nationalist ones. So he is a liberal nationalist. So this fits with one of our types of liberalism. Uh, and this could be really important because if you're talking about differences between liberal nationalists and other types of nationalists, then Rousseau is your kind of your go to for liberal nationalist ideas. So he has several key, uh, key works. So um, probably the most well known is The Social Contract, which he wrote in 1762. And he also wrote uh, Considerations of Government of po on the Government of Poland in 1771-1772, which again is really important in terms of reflecting some of his ideas on uh, nationalism. Now, one of his key concepts is the idea of the general will. Uh, and then he's, what he's saying is that the, a nation's government is based on the indivisible collection of will of the community. So the government should serve the people and do what the people tell the government to do rather than the other way around, which had, had generally been the case with, with governments in the world up until that point, with kind of hereditary monarchies and things like that. <coughs> But we've got that kind of extra element of this collective will, and this is this idea that the people of the nation are going to want the same thing. Uh, now, we often see in democracies this isn't always the case, but this is what he believed within a true nation, that there would be this collective will, this community where people were pulling in, in the same direction. It, so he favoured a, a democracy, not monarchy. And he also talks about uh, nations having the right to, to govern themselves. So this is the idea of self-determination, which was a really, really important idea in the 18th century as we started to see things like um, the, uh, the war for independence in America. So we've, we've got here then that leads into what is known as civic nationalism. Uh, and this is where a state is legitimate because it is based on the active participants, uh, participation of its citizens. Uh, this is seen in, in countries, particularly in the United States of America, where, where you have people with a shared vision of, of rights, but also of responsibilities to follow the law. Uh, and therefore, people feel a real allegiance to their nation because they buy into um, the citizenship of it. They buy into the political ideas, uh, the political institutions. And this is a real cornerstone of liberal nationalism uh, going forward and is, is still is today. So we've got these idea, the ideas of essentially leads to the idea of nation states uh, and with civic nationalism, then there isn't necessarily a cultural requirement to be part of that nation. It, it, it's uh, something that you buy into. And so for Rousseau, nationalism fitted with freedom. Um, and again, this is not necessarily the way a lot of people think about nationalism, about it linking with, with democracy and freedom. But a lot of Rousseau's ideas clearly do. But he's, he's going back to his idea of a general will. This has been used uh, uh, by fascist countries and fascist leaders to say that essentially they are the embodiment of the general will of the people. They know what their community, what their nation wants and that they will do it on behalf of the people. So the general will idea and when Rousseau is writing about it, he sees this being carrying out in kind of democratic systems. Um, but nationalists have used this in, in terms of justifications uh, for dictatorships. Right. So Rousseau, a really, really important uh, li uh, liberal nationalist. Now, Johann Gottfried von Herder, um, or just Herder, 
with making life a bit easier, is another important one of our early nationalists. Now, he's very, very different to Rousseau. He is a, a reactionary rather than a, a follower of the Enlightenment. Uh, and so whilst uh, Rousseau's idea was um, in lots of ways uh, rational, then, then Herder's one is unambiguously emotional. So it's, it's an irrational um, type of nationalism uh, as opposed to a, a more rational one, which you can see in, in civic nationalism under under Rousseau, you can see where people are, are, are making a choice and buying into a nation. It's very different with Herder because you're not you're not making a choice or buying into it. Then you are part of a nation, and this is a cultural thing rather than a choice. Uh, and his key work is treatise on the origins of language, and, and there's a big uh, clue in that that what he sees as central to the formation of a nation. So he is a, a, the key writer of kind of culturalism or cultural nationalism. Uh, and he says that every nation is different, um, that every nation has its own unique kind of cultural character. And therefore, this leads to every country having its own set of values. And therefore, a lot of the universal ideas that we been pushed around at this time, such as liberalism, he says, well, you can't apply liberalism to uh, all all situations in all countries because it won't fit with the values and the, the characteristics of some nations and they, therefore it should be individualistic to that in absolute uh, to that in particular nation so it it's linked with uh, both modern cultural liberalism so for example uh, the kind of uh, cultural nationalism we see in Wales, which is about protecting the language and the culture uh, whilst being surrounded by the more dominant English culture. But it, it is also um, linked to kind of radical nationalists. So Herder defined the German people and he, he's writing at a period of time when the, uh, Germany hasn't been uh, formed as an individual nation. He's writing as a, uh, as, as being based on language. Now, Hitler also divide, de defined who the German people were based on, on language. The difference is, is that Hitler also introduced race. Uh, Herder himself doesn't write about race. He talks about language and culture. So that, again, there are aspects of this that are used in really kind of the, the radical, the really extreme forms of nationalism. But that's not necessarily what Herder was directing it towards. Now, Herder's idea is based, is based on the, the people. He, he, the German word is, is Volk. Um, uh, and he, what he was saying is, is that essentially every national culture has a, a special nature, what he called the Volkgeist. Uh, and in each, each nation, you should, they should truly express this kind of special nature, this special culture, and they should do it through their own, own language. And that language and that expression of their culture bound the people together. Uh, and it was through that that they were able to express their national identity. So again, language is absolutely key. And there's there's something kind of emotional, kind of something spiritual about na a nationhood uh, to, to Herder. And it's definitely something that isn't a rational choice or or, or based on anything else. It, it's language, it's culture. And, and then he, he says, people should be patriotic they should have patriotism uh, and that that was again because nation he saw as an identity thing so being of a certain nation was a central part um to to everybody's uh, everybody's identity and it, and he said he said that he that has lost his patriotic spirit has lost himself and again we can see this passion in, in the in the context of german nationalism pre-Germany, if that makes sense. So there's the German language, there's German culture, but the German people were spread across a multitude of many, many different states. So we don't have a unified Germany. Unified Germany is going to happen in the 1870s. And so what we're lo looking at here is a nationalist who is talking about a nation that doesn't exist in a political, single political form. 
Right. Giuseppe Man, uh, Manzini, uh, 1805 to 1872, is a, a really famous Italian nationalist. He's associated with another Giuseppe, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Uh, he formed Young Italy in the 1830s with the objective of overthrowing hereditary monarchies across the, uh, that dominated a lot of the Italian states. Again, Italy wasn't a single nation at this point. It was made up of a multitude of different states that were controlled, were either independent or controlled by other, other groups or empires. He fought against the Austrian Empire that was trying to dominate uh, other Italian states and, and control the Italian peninsula. Uh, and his dream of a uni unified Italy does ultimately uh, come true right at the end uh, of his lifetime. Um, now, again, we see this kind of um, spiritual kind of connection between nationhood and people. Uh, anybody that humans could, could express themselves um, via their, their nation uh, and, and that human freedom re rested on the creation of one's own nation. So until you have your own nation, uh, you are not truly free. Uh, and he talks about nation states. And he, so he, he talks about within a nation state, um, it'd be made up of free and equal citizens who were who were kind of bound together and unified. Uh, and again, we've kind of always got this, this, well, we have got this spiritual element to all that. So we can see some elements of this that, that connect to liberal nationalism, but also other elements of it that aren't necessarily completely liberal. But we've got this idea of free citizens, certainly. Now, the bit that makes it difficult to, to have Manzini as, as purely a kind of liberal nationalism is that he, he rejects intellectualism, he rejects rationalism. So again, we've got an irrational, emotional response to nationalism. Uh, and he created an idea of what is known as thought and action. Uh, and he suggested that every thought must be followed by an action. And, and this is really is demonstrated in his own nationalism, um, because he doesn't just think about a, an Italian nation and, and, and what it should look like. He's actually out actively fighting and creating groups and getting involved, trying to bring about a, uh, a an Italian nation. And again, we go back to this, this kind of lack of, of rationality and, 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 and a degree of spirituality in terms of the way he talks about nationalism, because he believed that, that people were had been divided into nations by God. And therefore, this was a kind of a spiritual thing to do to, to the work of God to get back into and create the nation which God had created and making sure that it was uh, it was there in practice on Earth. So an interesting uh, take on nationalism, and again, we a bit like Herder, we've got a very emotional response, and particularly because we've got nationalism in a country that doesn't exist as a as as a single national group at the time that that um, Manzini is active. Uh, Manzini again is is a, is there in, involved in the movement towards the formation of an Italian nation, whilst Herder, uh, in terms of the German idea, is is writing a more a, a, a longer period of time before it actually happens. Right, the next one we we get into our really extreme uh, ideas of nationalism next. So so with, uh, Charles Maurras. Um, was a French uh, right-wing uh, nationalist, very much a, a reactionary. He was uh, pro-monarchy, he was anti-Semitic, he was anti-democratic. He, he supported the pro-fascist Vichy regime, which was the uh, fascist-style regime that was put in charge of um, France when the, the Nazis had, had defeated um, the, the French army and, and conquered France in 1940. Um, his his key work it was a journal that ran ran through um, from 1899 called Action Française, uh, and his key idea was something called integral nationalism, and again this is a very intensely emotional irrational form of nationalism, uh, where individual individuals are encouraged to submerge themselves into their nation, and and this is what makes it integral. It is a, an absolutely essential part of everybody according uh, to Morass's ideas. And it, it, it makes the nation you are from and the nation, and therefore you submerge yourself into that, na that nation, national culture and ideas, that, that, that is a huge part of, therefore of who you are. And it tends to promote aggressive expansionism um, and it is commonly associated uh, with fascism and totalitarian regimes. Uh, where the state controls every aspect of people's lives because the the individual is submitting 
to the nation as a whole. The na you don't have individual identity, you have a national identity. Uh, and so you are looking to for the, the greatness of your nation. If you've got people who believe in the greatness of their nation, then they have a tendency to believe that no nation is superior and better than the other nations that surround them. So this may, means that the morass is anti-individualism. Um, so their own nations get put to one side. Um, and he believed that in France, individualism that had been encouraged by the French Revolution and by liberalism had caused a decline in France. And so, again, this is a regressive form of nationalism, highly regressive, which is, is looking back to a kind of glamorized past going, this is when France was great and we should go back to that. Uh, and, and he says that we that France lost its greatness by abandoning monarchy, uh, separating church from state, adopting democracy. So he essentially wants to wind back the clock, go back and reinstate all of those things. And then he says France will be great again. He also blamed uh, the influence of, of, um, of people from outside France. He was highly xenophobic. Uh, he supported the suppression of freedom. Uh, he, as I said, I mentioned before, he was highly anti-Semitic. Now, these kind of extreme right wing ideas have continued um, to, to have an audience in France. Uh, and uh, there's a party in France called Front National, uh, which was headed, is headed by uh, Marine Le Pen. And they, these kind of anti-individual, anti-foreigner, um, anti anti-different uh, races, uh, anti-democracy ideas have continued in this kind of fascist, extreme right wing type of politics. It, it, his writing also ha has found um, support in some of the nativist movements in the United States. Another key part of his ideology is militarism. Uh, and so he, he says that in, in, with integral nationalism, it encourages a nation to have a strong military ethos. Uh, part of this with them might be their, their struggle for independence or regaining independence. And it is then connects into ideas of, of a nation superiority. And it, we see this in extreme, um, extreme forms of nationalism. Uh, so Morass is, is really the form of nationalism that we we see taken on board by the likes of um, Mussolini in Italy and Hitler in Germany. Uh, that is exclusive, um, so it excludes groups of people, says that you aren't part of us, that, you, that it creates that them and us. It, it dislikes um, people because of race or religion or because they're from other nations. So whilst the liberal national embraces other nations and that you have your independent nation states but you'll work together in, in morass's idea we then lead to this uh, chauvinistic expansionistic uh, form of nationalism which says we're better than you guys and we're going to go and take your take your land and subject you to our control right the last of our key thinkers is is, is again a, a really important and and different view on nationalism uh, and this is uh, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey um, was, was quite an incredible guy. He was a, a, a politician. He was a writer. He was a businessman, entrepreneur. Uh, and he made most of his career in America, though he was um, from the Caribbean. Uh, his key texts are a uh, message to the people, which he wrote in 1937. Uh, and the, he ran a journal called Negro World, which was read across three continents. Uh, and he created the uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association uh, and the Black Star, uh, Black Star Line Shipping Company. So we've got a kind of political, AIM uh, was a worldwide political organization. We've got a, um, an entrepreneurial, bi a business idea, the Black, the Black Star Line Shipping Company. And the idea of that was it would provide transport and trade uh, between uh, the, the black people of the United States of America and the black people in, in Africa. Um, lots of people invested money in it, including uh, the parents of Malcolm X, who Garvey's idea had a, a huge impact on it. Um, Garvey was not ultimately a hugely successful businessmen and, and uh, things like the uh, Black Star Line shipping company came into kind of great financial difficulties. But what underpinned all of that was, was uh, his kind of uh, political philosophy. So one of the key aspects of this was black pride. So he encouraged uh, African people to be proud of their race and see beauty in their own kind. Uh, and, and what he talked about was the kind of psychological impact of um, subject, uh, sub subjugation uh, and dominance of uh, white culture where a lot of uh, in the world and, and, and particularly in places like America a lot of black people 
uh, lived and the what was presented to them was ideas of, of beauty which didn't reflect them and so what he was encouraging people to do was to go back to African styles of dress to um, to not try and straighten hair to make it, the hair look uh, look more like that of, of white people's but to to embrace the afro hair and all, all kind of aspects like that and he saw this as a really important part of, of moving towards a kind of uh, independence and empowerment was seeing black was beautiful was essentially what he was saying now another really important part of his ideas was pan-africanism uh, and this was the idea that the african people in every part of the world were one people so he saw the black population of the world as all part of one single uh, group one single nation uh, and he said that they wouldn't progress unless they put aside their, all their cultural and ethical and ethnic differences and saw themselves as a single united group now one of the bits was re which is really really controversial with marcus garvey it is one of the other bits he talks about with with this as well as uh, as the black population across the world kind of uniting and creating this pan-african movement and a, a single black nation uh, is he talks about separatism uh, and so he actually argued in favour of racial uh, separation. And, and what he said was that for the black people of the world to gain political and economic independence, um, they, they would have to be uh, empowered. And to be empowered, they had to, to, to create their own political and economic systems independent of uh, the white people. Uh, and he, he said that what black identity had been prevented from being fully realized due to the constraints in living in a world and societies that were dominated um, by white men. And so he said, right, we need proper independence and we need to live um, separately. And he looked at various schemes in terms of creating um, separatism, uh, either inside the America or a lot of the system's idea of black populations moving back to Africa and, and creating a nation there. So we've got an idea of a national identity, uh, which is, is based on race, but not culture or ethnic difference. Right, so I hope that's been helpful. I've gone through in quite a lot of detail the uh, the five different key thinkers and that you need to think about the these ideas and what they say and how it relates to the different types of of nationalism and the different arguments and themes that we've looked at in the previous videos uh, please remember to like make sure uh, if you haven't done so already to subscribe and then you'll be able to see all my other uh, a-level politics videos that, that come up and you'll be able to easily find uh, the, the, this playlist which goes through all the different aspects for political ideas. And again, any questions or queries, please leave us, leave us a comment. Well, again, I hope you, have, you found this series really helpful and I look forward to hearing from you all. Hit that subscribe button. Speak to you soon.